and thanks over for coming. So um, um, I'm very glad to have the chance to talk about my research, which is centered around uh, ferroelectric uh, materials. Uh, today's presentation is really a two-step approach to a better understanding about the dynamic response of ferroelectric materials. In the first part of my presentation, I will focus on intrinsic ferroelectric switching. For intrinsic, I mean a pure bark response under ideal mechanical boundary condition and in absence of defects. Uh, it was actually my first PhD project and really got finished after I joined GL, so it's a, like a six year project. Uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will share with you uh, my recent work, uh, collaborate with Ron, which is, which is to understand the effect of extrinsic defects on ferroelectric -like switching and to uh, improve material performance uh, through defect and engineering. Uh, just in case I run out of time, I would like to first acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Professor Andrew Rapp at the University of Pennsylvania, and Ilya Greenberg, who is my mentor during my PhD. He's now a professor at Bar Ilan University at Israel, and of course, uh, Ron here at Carnegie. Okay, um, so some introduction about ferroelectric material. So ferroelectric material is characterized by spontaneous switchable polarization. Here I show the structure of lead titanate, which is a prototypical uh, ferroelectric perovskite. So as you can see, at ground state, the titanium atom favors off-center spontaneously. This gives rise to a, a polarization. And this polarization can be switched by applying electric field along, uh, in this case, minus z direction, these two states are energetically equivalent. So, and, and, and as you can see, they can serve as binary state in computer science, in computer, and this makes them useful in memory device. Um, the origin of ferro electricity becomes clear in Ron's uh, pioneer work almost 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. It really, uh, it really depends on the delicate balance between uh, short range repulsion which favors uh, high symmetry phase and long range coolant forces that favor instability of high symmetry phase. So it's a very delicate uh, property. In a real material, fire electric fire usually adopt a more domain state. Here I show uh, three, I believe, are electron transmission uh, micro, micrographs. Uh, as you can see here, um, it has two domains. 
On the left, the, the position is pointing up. On the right, the position is pointing down. And the domain wall is defined as the interface separating two domains. In this case, it is, and we can see a blue line here, and, and the angle between these two domains is 90 degree. In this very recent Nature paper, paper they can re, they can actually um, since uh, propel fire electric vortex. You, pro you probably cannot see uh, clearly, but uh, they can. It has this well-defined uh, vortex, fire electric vortex, and this is a piezo response uh, force microscope. What it did is they deposit uh, fire electric PZT on substrate of one-on-one -on -one orientation. This gives rise to a very uh, complex nano-twin domain uh, patterns of different colors rep represent domains uh, with different uh, polarization orientation. Okay, so fire materials have many important applications from sonar to transducer, uh, memory device, thermal imaging, and, and medical ultrasound. And all these applications can be captured by this triangular diagram. It really depends on the coupling between polarization, strain, and entropy. Um, for example, by applying electric field, we can change the polarization because polarization and strain are strongly coupled. Uh, it will give rise to change in strain. This is to convert electric signal to mechanical signal. Vice versa, uh, by applying uh, the strain change due to mechanical stress, can give rise to a switching current. This is to convert mechanical signal to electric signal. As you can see, all these important applications depend on the interaction between polarization and external perturbations, such as electric field, stress, and uh, temperature. It is crucial to understand the dynamics of electric materials and external perturbations. So experimentally, fire electric switching is characterized routinely uh, by polarization electric field hysteresis loop. Uh, this is like the fingerprint of a fire electric material. Uh, it's very easy to uh, measure. And from this plot, we can learn a lot about the fire electric material. Uh, the two most important uh, uh, values here. The first is the remnant polarization, which is the magnitude of the polarization uh, in the absence of electric field. The second is the coercive field, which is the electric field required to switch the polarization. Fire electric material has been studied for more than 50 years. You may think that it, it sh theoretically should be easy to calculate the coarser field, but it turns out to be a challenge in material science. Um, people try to calculate the coarser field based on the barrier, hi barrier height in this double well potential. However, the theoretical coarser field using this barrier height are magnitudes of higher than experimental values. Because this really corresponds to a homogeneous switching process, in which I mean all the dipoles will respond to the electric field collectively and they will switch at the same time. But this is never the case in experiments. People know that polarization switching is dictated by domain wall motion. Here I show a 180 degree domain wall. On the left, the red domain has polarization pointing up. On the right, the blue domain has polarization pointing down. So by applying an up electric field, the domain will move eventually we'll get rid of this blue domain. How, then how to, how to uh, connect the domain with velocity uh, to uh, macroscopic coercive field? Uh, before uh, our work, there's, there's no such um, method or framework. Furthermore, we know that materials are, uh, contain a lot of defects, and the effect of extrinsic defects is not clear, but is critical for nanoscale application. The goal of my research is to provide an atomistic understanding of the physics domain wall and defects at a finite temperature. So I'm a computational material scientist. Here I show the computational modeling hierarchy, and this is also the toolbox, a toolbox uh, for computational material scientists. Um, generally speaking, the more accurate the method, the more expensive it becomes. Here we have classical empirical methods, uh, uh, using uh, classical force fields for molecular dynamic simulations. Here we have high accurate but very expensive first principle methods like uh, density function theory and many body methods like quantum Monte Carlo. The strategy we adopt is to use these highly accurate first principle methods to parameterize classical force fields and then use those force fields for large scale classical molecular dynamic simulations. 
Um, it turns out, in many cases, this so-called second principle method can be both accurate and efficient. A uh, very brief introduction about molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, first principle methods, uh, quantum mechanical methods, are basically to solve Schrodinger equation. Uh, conventional uh, first principle methods are mostly limited to studying zero Kelvin properties. It is difficult to obtain dynamic information because you don't have thermal fluctuation. And they're very expensive for large scale, long time scale uh, simulations. Uh, molecular dynamic simulation is, a classical, is based on classical mechanics. It involves numerical step by step solution of classical equations of motion, as shown here. We can calculate the force based on the uh, potential. This is a schematic of the algorithm of molecular dynamic simulations. We start with a configuration, we know the position of atoms. We can then calculate the force and acceleration for each atom. We then move the atoms for a small time step. This will lead to a new configuration. We repeat this cycle. And th this is how system evolves in molecular dynamic simulation. As you can see, the potential that describes the uh, interaction between atoms is very important for molecular dynamic simulation. Um, in practice, we need a predefined force field in order to run MD simulations. And the quality of the force field dictates the quality, uh, the efficiency and accuracy of molecular dynamic simulations. It turns out that it is really challenging to have a good force field to uh, describe transition metal oxides, which is the system we are interested in. So during my PhD, I developed the model potential based on um, two conservation principles in bond valence theory. Uh, bond valence is a very useful empirical, em empirical concept that describes the bonding strengths. It, it can be calculated using this equation. Rij is the distance between atom I and atom J. R0 and R0 IJ, CIJ are brown empirical parameters. They're readily available for many different atomic pairs. So, so basically, the VIJ is the bond value. So basically, the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond length. Very intuitive. So in bond value theory, bond valence conservation principle states that each atom has a preferred atom valence and crystal structure. And the actual atom valence can be calculated by summing over the bond valence around atom. Uh, here's a very simple example. This is the ground state structure of water molecule. If we use the equilibrium uh, bond length for OH bond and use the Brown empirical parameters for oxygen and hydrogen pair, we will find that the bond valence for OH bond is 1. Uh, as you can see, the valence sum around the oxygen atom is equal to 2, which is the atomic valence of oxygen. However, in this distorted water molecule, the OH bond is shorter, uh, therefore the bond valence becomes larger than 1. So consequently, the valence sum around the oxygen is larger than 2. We know that the distorted water molecule should have a higher energy. Based on the, this simple observation, we develop a bond valence energy. Uh, so Vi is the instantaneous valence sum. V sub 0 i is the desired preferred atom valence. As you can see, this equation basically says any deviation from the desired uh, valence sum will give rise an energy penalty. SI is a parameter we need to uh, uh, fit. Uh, it, it has the unit of energy. So this is basically the harmonic uh, potential. However, if we look at this water molecule, artificial water molecule, the OH bond is still at its equilibrium length. Therefore, uh, the, the valence sum around the oxygen atom is still equal to 2. In another word, these two structures will have the same bond valence energy. To resolve this issue, we introduced the concept of bond valence vector, which is defined as a vector aligned along the bond. Besides the scalar sum, now we have a vector sum. As you can see, the vector sum is a natural way to capture the break of uh, symmetry. For ferrochemical material, it is very important because Ferrochemical material has this spontaneous break of symmetry. Following the same spirit of bond valence energy, we developed, uh, we propose a bond valence vector energy, which basically says any deviation from the desired vector sum will cause an energy penalty. Now we can look at our model potential. It's a very simple model potential, only four energy terms. We have cooling interaction. Each atom is treated as a charged particle. We have short range of partial, which is taken from Levin Jones potential to prevent atoms moving too close to each other during a simulation. And these two energy terms from two conservation 
principles. We successfully parameterized this uh, uh, parameterized uh, uh, force field using using the energies from density functional theory, um, and this potential uh, can reproduce a lot of experimental results. I think the most important thing is that it can be really efficient. Now we can simulate a mini atom uh, system uh, with with this with a reasonable amount of computational uh, resource. Okay, now we we. Now we think we have the tool to study the domain dynamics at a finite temperature. The, uh, so this is the conventional understanding about domain dynamics. Uh, it is usually considered as an elastic interface moving a disordered uh, medium and defect can pin the domain. And this is the theoretical uh, relationship between domain velocity and external electric field. There are two regions. In a creep region, the domain velocity depends on the driving force exponentially and has very strong uh, temperature dependence. In a dependent region, uh, the domain velocity has no temperature dependence and has th and the relationship between velocity and electric field is close to linear. This relationship is uh, confirmed experimentally in this PRL paper. Uh, the mu here is called dynamic expo exponent. Experimentally, wide ranging values have been observed and they are usually attributed to the types of defects. I will come back to this point later, but what would be the intrinsic response in ideal defect-free case? And this is the question we, we would like to answer. So this, then we decided to look at the uh, dynamics of 90 degree domain wall, and this is the supercell we use to construct uh, domain structures with 90 degree domain wall. Uh, it, is, uh, it has 320,000 atoms. And this is the side view of the domain pattern. You can see the zigzag domain pattern. And this boundary is the 90 degree domain wall separating two different domains. In, we can apply electric field along a 100 direction. This domain is not favored because dipoles are, uh, are, are opposing the applied electric field. So this domain will shrink and due to domain wall motion. And in, in simulation, it's pretty straightforward to extract the domain wall velocity. So we can run a simulation and a wide range of temperature and electric fields. The goal is to explore the intrinsic temperature and the field dependence of the wall uh, velocity. This is a movie from um, MD simulations. You can see the motion of the domain wall and the shrink of this uh, assigned uh, uh, domain. And you will repeat the process again. Okay. Okay. So this slide is the most important slide in this presentation. It summarizes the results of hundreds of calculations. Uh, I plot here is the velocity as a function of electric field. Immediately, we can see two regions. In the low field region, the domain of velocity has very strong temperature dependence, which is signature of creep. In the high field region, the lines start to overlap with each other and the temperature dependence becomes weak, and this is the signature of depleting. And we can plot the log V as a function of 1 over E for this low field uh, data. We found that it actually uh, follows the so-called MERS law, that is the velocity depending on the electric field exponentially. And the slope of the uh, line is the so-called activation field. So uh, once we know the activation field, it becomes very easy to calculate the the domain wall velocity. Uh, the most important, I think, we for the first time demonstrate that the vo velocity can be described with a creep like region and depending like region in the absence of defects. So, this is really an intrinsic transition. We don't, defects probably may influence the dynamics, but to get this intrinsic transition, we don't need defects at all. Um, one good thing about molecular dynamics simulation is that it can provide uh, structure evolution information with really fine time resolution. So we can look at a nucleation, process, a nucleation event at the domain boundary. So the domain will moves by switching uh, dipoles layer by layer. So as you can see, at the very beginning, some units, a cluster of unit cells will switch uh, uh, to, align with the, to, to align with the external electric field. This forms a nucleus. The growth, the growth of the nucleus eventually will lead to the switch of the whole layer. So we, our MD simulation reveal a diamond 
like nucleus at the domain boundary, you can see that the boundary is very uh, diffuse. This is in this actually contradict with a classical nucle nucleation model in Fairlectrics, which was proposed um, more than 50 years ago. It, it was still considered as the standard model, nucleation model for Fairlectrics. In this model, uh, a triangular-shaped nucleus is assumed somehow. And uh, the, uh, there are a lot of equations here, but I'm going to only highlight the key points. So the energy of the nucleus has three terms. The first term is the co comes from the coupling between uh, polarization and electric field. This is the energy gain for having dipoles aligned with the electric field. The second term is the interfacial energy because you're uh, doing a, a switching process, we're creating actual interface. Uh, the sigma w is the domain of energy. The third term is so-called depolarization energy. It really comes, comes from the repulsion between those two uh, boundaries because we have polarization uh, discontinuity here. So these two boundaries are both uh, positively charged. And in this model, uh, they derive the aspect ratio. So A is the width of the nucleus. L is the length of the nucleus. It is assumed that the depolarization energy is much, much larger than the domainal energy. So as you can see from this equation, this inevitably leads to a really a triangular-shaped uh, nucleus with very large length and very small a because sigma p is much larger than sigma w. However, uh, in this 2002 paper, it was realized that this model doesn't really work. Uh, if, if we use the accurate domain energy, uh, the model will give a, will predict an unphysically large critical nucleus and unphysically large nucleation barrier. The predict domain velocity is much, much slower than those observed experimentally. So when we submit a paper to uh, Nature, one of the referees say, oh, you guys really should look at this you know, why not model. I mean, why in your simulation you see a diamond-shaped nucleus, the aspect ratio is close to one, however in this model, it was predict or, or assumed that the aspect ratio should be really, really large. So we did a really detailed uh, analysis and find that four, fact, four things contribute to the reduced row of depolarization. So several years ago, Rap Group has a paper. They found that the, sh the, the, the shape of the nucleus has a bellwork shape. So instead of really sharp boundary, the boundary is kind of inclined. So this effectively reduced the domain wall error, or equivalently assume the same domain wall, domain wall error, the domain wall energy, the effective domain wall energy should be smaller. So uh, in middle wider model, the width of the critical nucleus depends on the domain wall energy. A smaller effective domain wall energy means a smaller critical nucleus, and therefore smaller depolarization energy. We also look at a polarization profile uh, at a domain boundary. It turns out that dipoles at a, uh, at, at a boundary uh, have smaller magnitude. This gives rise to a higher dielectric constant because smaller dipoles are easier to rotate. This means higher dielectric constant, so this increases the screening and also uh, smaller boundary charge because the boundary charge is basically proportional to the magnitude of the polarization at a boundary. Furthermore, uh, if you look at a, uh, because the, the nucleus has a diamond shape, the repulsion between these two uh, boundaries are partially compensated by the attraction between these two oppositely charged uh, boundaries. This again reduced the uh, depolarization energy. Uh, we did some numerical analysis. What I show here is the energy of the nucleus as a function of uh, nuclear size. So the black line is the original uh, middle wire model. After uh, Gradually introducing the right boundary conditions, we can see that um, the size of the critical nucleus becomes much smaller and the nucleation uh, barrier is reduced significantly. Okay, so that means the domainal energy is actually much larger than the depolarization energy. Now, if we come back to this uh, equation for aspect ratio, because now the domain energy is much larger than the uh, depolarization energy, the aspect ratio should be close to one as, pre as revealed by our molecular dynamics simulations. Now we have a much simpler model for nucleation. It has 
the energy of the nucleus now has only two terms, the, domain, the interfacial energy, the sigma against the uh, domain energy, and the coupling between polarization and electric field. This is energy gain. It's very easy to, by taking a derivative with, re with respect to L, L is basically the size of the nucleus, we can get a critical nuclear size and the nucleation barrier. Uh, and you can see the higher the electric field, the smaller the uh, critical nucleus. So that means when the electric field is low, uh, nucleation is the rate limiting step, and the barrel is much larger than thermal fluctuation. So whenever we need a thermal fluctuation to overcome barrel, we will expect uh, our new dependence on a driving force, just like the chemical reaction. However, when the electric field is high, the size of the nucleus is really, the size of the critical nucleus is already quite small. Applying high electric field is basically generating more and more nucleus that are similar size. So this, again, uh, naturally uh, explain the creep to dependent transition. Here, we have two things happening. Applying a high electric field will reduce the size of critical nucleus. It will also generate more and more nucleus. So we have uh, two, uh, two uh, effects. So that's why the uh, increase is close to expon exponential. But here, uh, as I said, High electric field is basically generating more and more nucleus, small nucleus that have similar size. Uh, a linear relationship is then uh, expected. Okay, these are all um, interesting. Uh, hopefully, you you will think them uh, cool physics. But what can we do with this model? So we decide to use the uh, insights revealed from molecular dynamics simulation to construct uh, an analytic model to calculate the uh, nucleation energy. Uh, we develop a model based on uh, landau ginzburg davidson theory. Uh, the ingredients are still the same, two energy terms. We have energy grain for dipoles aligned with electric field and energy panel for creating new domain walls. The most important thing is that the parameters required to calculate the energy of a nucleus can be directly obtained from first principle calculations. Um, so this allows us to estimate nucleation energetics uh, really fast. So here I show the nucleation energy as a function of a nuclear size. We can then get a barrel at different temperatures. We can look at a relationship between nucleation barrel and electric field, from which we can extract the activation field. So we compare the, uh, the, the result from our analytic model and, and those directly obtained from MD summation agreement is pretty good. Let me remind you, previously, in order to get this activation field, we need to run simulations. We, we, run, we need to run molecular dynamics simulations and uh, different field magnitude and then get log V over 1 over E and then get a slope to get activation field. But now, just use a few parameters uh, accessible with density function theory, we can easily predict uh, activation field. So what, once we know the activation field, uh, it's become pretty straightforward to calculate, a, uh, to simulate a hysteresis loop and a coercive field. Again, we assume that the polarization switching is realized through the domain of motion. Uh, so the size of the domain becomes one parameter. Uh, we, can cap we can calculate activation field using this multi scale scheme using a few parameters from density function theory. And once we know the activation field, we can get the domain of velocity. Then it's pretty trivial to calculate how long it takes for the domain wall to move uh, a distance of d. And we apply it to barium titanate and also uh, PZT. Our predict course, uh, so the lines are theoretical values uh, for domains of different sizes, and the uh, points are experiment data. The agreement is not perfect, but for such a simple uh, model using just a few parameters, uh, now the, dis the discrepancy is no longer orders of magnitude, it's still within the same order. Uh, I, I, we're pretty excited about this method because now we can use this model to do high throughput. Uh, uh, calculations to screen fire electrons with desired uh, coercive field. Okay, now I'm going to switch gear. I'm going to talk about defects in fire electrics, and it I would say it's almost impossible to get rid of defects in materials, in, in particular in uh, oxide uh, perovskites. Experimentally, people actually are in, uh, intentionally uh, to introduce uh, defects. In this case by replacing titanium 4 plus with magnesium 2 plus. To maintain a charge neutrality, it has to be compensated by nearby oxygen vacancy. So this creates a defect dipole. 
and a dipolar electric field which can couple with nearby ferroelectric unit cells with uh, dipole moments. Uh, experimentally, somehow people categorized the defect into two types. One is so-called random bond type. It will change the barrier height of this double well potential. It was suggested that this will give rise to change of the coercive field, but the hysteresis loop will remain to be symmetric. The random field type defect, on the other hand, will make the double L potential asymmetric, correspondingly give, giving rise to an asymmetric hysteresis loop. So whenever people see something strange in, in their marriage hysteresis loops, they will just say, okay, probably we have some kind of defect. There's, at this point, uh, of course we're still working on it, uh, there's still a lack between a uh, microscopic structure feature and the type of defect. So um, this, the, the, the specific problem that interests both Ron and me is this so-called defect dipole induced strain recovery. Um, let's first look at the normal case. So this is a tetracnal ferroelectric. It has a long axis C and a short axis A along X. The polarization, uh, the bulk polarization is along y. So by applying the electric field, the, the a will become c. The polarization will rotate. So now the long axis is along uh, x direction. This generates a large change in strain. The strain change is actually c minus a. Once we uh, remove the electric field, the, the structure will relapse, but it will stay more or less the same uh, because now the system is located at a different local minimum, and this barrier prevents any back switching. Then we apply the electric field along X again, we're not going to get any giant strain change because there's no uh, uh, CA exchange. In this Nature Material paper, Zen proposed a very interesting uh, mechanism. Uh, so let's say initially their defect dipoles they are represented here by a black arrow. They are aligned with the bark polarization. Now we again we apply electric field along x direction. We have this giant strain change because a becomes c and c becomes a. But the defect dipole is geometrically constrained. They cannot be switched by polarization. Once we remove the electric field, the defect dipole, because of the dipolar electric field, will orient it we will orient the polarization back to its original uh, uh, direction. This recovery, that means the defect dipole serves as the driving force for the recovery process. If we apply electric field again, we, we can uh, get this large strain change. So as you can see, this reversible large strain change resembles the shape memory uh, effect in some metals and can be very useful. So what we would like to know is, is to really understand the microscopic picture because I'm a, I would say I'm more like a physicist. I care about the mechanism and, and the physics. So uh, again, uh, I did some molecular dynamics simulations uh, using the fourth field I developed uh, for barium titanate. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 supercell with 5,000 atoms. Uh, I still try to keep the model as simple as possible, so I didn't really remove atoms to create uh, defects. What I did is to, it's more like a trick. So the generic defect dipole consists of oppositely charged dummy atoms, as shown here. So I place two particles equidistantly away from the titanic atom. Um, and during the simulation, the atoms are fixed. I only care about electronic electrostatic interaction between those defect dipoles and the surrounding uh, environment. Uh, by varying the charge of those two particles, we can easily vary the, char the, the magnitude of defect dipole. And it's very easy to control the orientation of defect dipoles, the concentration, magnitude, and spacing between defect dipoles. It's, uh, this is here I also show the electric field arise associated with from those defect dipole. Uh, as you can see, so this shows the magnitude of the, of the electric field. You can clearly see the typical shape of a dipolar uh, electric field. Okay, this, 
uh, this is a busy slide. Um, I try to explain it. Um, uh, what I did is to simulate the polarization electric field and the strain electric field hysteresis loops. So I apply the electric field along x, y, and z direction. And in this first case, uh, the charge of those dummy atoms are zero. That means it doesn't create any it doesn't create any, any dipolar electric field. And the resulting hysteresis loops are very symmetric and isotropic along Cartesian axis. And this is actually a good thing. That means our model makes sense because when the, those dummy atoms uh, um, don't have any charge, it, it can recover intrinsic response. In the second case, now the dummy atoms have some charge and I randomly orient those defect dipoles in my supercell. And it, you probably can not, okay, there are a lot of gray lines. They're actually the uh, hysteresis loop for a particular configuration, but I care about the average response. Surprisingly, the average response highlighted by those colored lines are still, are still pretty symmetric and isotropic, but they have smaller switching field compared with intrinsic response. This reminds me of the random bond type defect, which is claimed to only modulate the barrier height, but will not influence the symmetry of the double well potential. In, sorry. In the third case, I align the defect dipoles along minus y direction. This gives rise to dramatic different hysteresis loops. Perpendicular to the direction of defect dipole, I get this double hysteresis. Along y direction, you can see the shift of the hysteresis loops. Again, this, is, uh, rem this reminds me of random field type of defect, which says that we are asymmetrized uh, double well potential. Uh, we, did, we also looked at the effect of concentration and dipole magnitude. Is not surprisingly, higher concentration, the higher uh, dipole magnitude can give rise to larger building electric field. So along the direction that that is perpendicular to the uh, defect dipole orientation, we can see the evolution of a single loop to a double loop. And we can clearly see the shift of the uh, hysteresis loops along y direction. We also see something very interesting about dipole, uh, uh, defect dipole spacing. Uh, so in our simulations, the lowest defect concentration that can give rise to spontaneous strain recovery is around 0.7%. Uh, which is pretty reasonable compared to some experimental data. Uh, some, one thing that's very interesting is for the same defect con concentration, so in these two cases, there are 64 defect dipoles in a really big supercell. However, in this case, the distance between neighboring dipoles is three unit cell. We can see the spontaneous strain recovery. That is, when we turn on electric field, we can see the chain, the, the, the the long axis 